Technology has changed the face of marketing. What you can measure about people has changed the face of marketing. And so unlike 20 years ago when I first started as an academic and you could teach people surveys and you could teach people focus groups and basic marketing research, now we have to worry about social media, we have to worry about set-top box data, we have to worry about mobile behavior, and the thing is, technology is increasing faster and faster. I'm not a technology professor, but damn, all these technology people make my job really, really hard. Could, could you imagine going into a company and saying, we know the impact of your spend in marketing? And they're like, great. Oh, and I say, by the way, I don't have any data on social media, and so I've left that out. And they're like, get out of here. What are you doing in front of me? And so that's what I'm going to talk about today, which is, I've titled this, it's slightly different than what Sam said, but it's the same idea, the golden age of marketing. I'm gonna take you on a quick history lesson, starting from the 1950s. We always think, as marketers, that we got it made. We got it solved. Unfortunately, we never do. Technology, better data, better information, always screws us up. We had it, we were just doing so good. When all we had to do was measure certain things like at the store level, man, we could just, man, we could do studies and we could find out answers. Problem is all those answers were wrong. So that's what I'm gonna to talk to you about today. So let me get started. So I, this, is my, this is one of my favorite slides. Um, the golden age of marketing research is always in the future, but unfortunately, we always think it's now. And let me give you my th uh, one example. If this was 1952 instead of 2012, so it's 60 years ago, they had no ability to measure Eric Bradlow, Lizanne Rohde, Sam Lundquist. There's no way they could know exactly what it is you're buying. There was no mechanism, there was no technology and data mechanism to do so. But what they could measure is stuff at the store. Like they knew each store, you know, stores know how much they buy, they know how much inventory they have left at the end of the week, they can do sales minus inventory, and know, they can do you know, purchases minus inventory and know how much they sold. They could look at aggregate prices. Just as a show of hands, if I went into your business today and said, I know how price elastic your customers are, and you're like, really? And I go, yeah. I took aggregate store level data, regressed it on sales, and came up with a coefficient, and that's what I did. How many people in here would be happy with that as a result, looking at aggregate level store data regressed on aggregate level prices? Anybody? Don't be shy. Put your hands up if you want to. I mean, the ridicule of everybody will shout upon you, but put your hand up if you want to. As we all realize, that's not the best way to measure things today, but you know what? That's all they could do in the 1950s. And as a matter of fact, academics tried to partner with people in industry then. As a matter of fact, there's a paper here. As a matter of fact, and I did not randomly, it wasn't, this is a paper, it just happens to be somebody from the University of Nottingham, um, on the price consciousness of consumers. It's how do you measure the elasticity of consumers' demand to prices given store level data? I mean, that's what they had. And it seemed like the golden age. But the problem is, it seemed like the golden age. You had all this stuff at the store, but think about all the things you're blind to if all you have is aggregate level store data. You don't know what media somebody was exposed to outside the store. You don't know what word of mouth they received. You don't even know anything except possibly all the in-store marketing. So again, it seemed like the golden age, but it really wasn't. Now let's fast forward to the 1960s and 70s. Anybody know what the golden age in marketing was in the 60s and 70s? Am I gonna have to cold call on somebody? One. Door-to-door -door marketing? S advertising, sort of, you're getting warmer. By the way, it's warm in this room, you're getting warmer. Turns out, actually, most of the advances in marketing, to, even today, come out of the direct mail business. And let me say why, and by the way, it's not the sexiest business in the world, but you can make a lot of money in direct mail. Think about how direct mail makes money. Their entire business rests on what we call contextual marketing. They've got to send you the right advertisement or flyer at the right place at the right time in your purchase funnel. Well, that's essentially what we do today in marketing. We serve you the right banner ad at the right time in the right part of your purchase funnel. People in direct mail have known this for 50 years. They just have crappy data. They don't, they've got the right idea. They've just got the wrong data. But, but let me just say, the good news about the data is at least it was at the individual level. I remember as a child, so I was not a marketing professor in the 60s and 70s, but I was a child in the 60s and 70s, and I remember my mom receiving, you know, 
flyers and coupons and stuff in the mail. And matter of fact, I remember, depending on what she would buy, she would get new coupons and stuff in the mail. It seemed like they were targeting stuff individually to her. And I'm like, wow, that's amazing. And again, it seemed like the golden age. As a matter of fact, academics were writing papers. This is for those of you who are the, are the Dutch. I will butcher it, but it's the University of Groningen. I'm sure I've butchered that. For those of you that speak Dutch, I apologize. But again, this was an academic paper, optimal selection for direct mail. I always like to tell this joke, by the way. People always ask me, Professor Bradley, what are the best academic papers to read? And I always say, it's very simple. Read the title. If you can't understand the title, don't read the paper. What do you think this paper is about? Optimal selection for direct mail. Hmm. Maybe it's about selecting the people who are optimal to send direct mail to. It's pretty obvious what this paper is about. But again, this was state-of-the-art marketing science in the 1960s and 70s because it was the best data they have. You're going to get, I'm sure, it's, even though I've only gone through the 50s and 60s and 70s, I think you can see the theme already. The best practice in marketing science. And don't, don't forget, marketing's a mathematical science today. If you don't think it's a mathematical science, go to Google and Facebook and Yahoo and Amazon and look at all the PhD statisticians and computer scientists they have running around. It's a, trust me, it's a, it's, a, it's a science today. But this was the best science that you could do in the 1970s. And again, the good news is you could target households. The Bradlow households, in New, I grew up in New York City, you could target them. But you didn't know what other promotions, you only, just, you only knew what you sent me. You didn't know what the competition sent me. You didn't know what other media habits, you had no idea how much TV I watched. There was no internet back then, but you had no idea what TV I watched. You didn't know what purchases I did at other stores. All you knew was what I, you know, what coupons I redeemed for your particular company. You didn't know what people, matter of fact, this is probably the most underappreciated fact in the field of marketing today. People always say, you gotta track people's purchases. And I'm like, no. What's equally informative is what people look at and choose not to buy. It's actually just as predictive of people's behavior by looking at which products you've looked at and let's say abandoned and chosen not to buy. It's also very informative. But they didn't know that. They didn't know word of mouth. But it seemed like the golden age. Of course it was the golden age. What was, the, what was there 10 years earlier? There was store level data. This is a lot better than store level data, but it's still not that great. Now this one you're all gonna get. What was the golden age of marketing in the 1980s? What was the big revolution, the 1980s, that changed the field of marketing? Any thoughts? TV? Commercials on TV? I think there's been commercials on TV a lot longer than that. Not the, uh, the internet, we wish. That's still, that's coming in the 1990s. That's the next one. Yeah, late 80s. I'm calling it 90s, but you're right. It was late 80s, early 90s. What, yes? Set-top boxes. We can't even get that data today. You have set-top box data? Make sure you leave me your card after this. I'm, I, I'm, two, I'm 10 blocks away from Comcast, and I can't even get set-top box data today. No, not set-top box data. So you're getting warmer. Club card membership actually was a big event. Loyalty programs was actually, I'll, I, I always like to talk about other stuff. Loyalty programs wasn't what I have on this slide. People always think loyalty programs benefit them. Forget it. It doesn't benefit you. It benefits the firm because they can track you over time. What was the big technological invention in the 1980s that revolutionized the field of marketing? Nope. Well, I'll just tell you. Nice, these are all good guesses, by the way. It was supermarket scanner data. This absolutely revolutionized the field of marketing. And trust me, this was the golden age. You could measure what people bought at the individual level and track it, whether it's through loyalty card, credit card, store card. You could track what people were buying. This was, un at the individual level, it was unbelievable. I'm sure you've all had experiences. You check out at the counter and all of a sudden these coupons spit out and they're targeted right at you. That's amazing. It seemed like it was so wonderful. You know, it just increased the eyesight. But of course, given the theme of the talk, you know people think it's the golden age, but it's not. And by the way, this paper that I just put up here on the screen, it's the most cited paper in the history of marketing academia. It's a logit model of brand choice calibrated on scanner data. What do you think this paper's about? It's a paper about what products people choose, and it was fit using scanner data. John Little and Guadagni, these were professors, John was a professor at MIT, Peter Guadagni, a Brit, by the way, um, was his doctoral student at MIT. 
they were the first ones to get any type of data from supermarkets based on what products people bought. And you know, how do prices impact what people buy? How do store promotions impact people buy? Well, you can talk about it all you want, but until you have any data, it's all just thinking about it. It's not the actual answer. So this is actually the most cited paper in the field of marketing. Now this might seem like great news, but here's the bad news. It revolutionized marketing, but you, didn't, you still didn't know what media they saw outside the store. Um, you couldn't track purchases at other stores because it really wasn't linked by credit card in those days. You couldn't track what they looked at and chose not to buy. You couldn't track word of mouth, but it seemed like the golden age. As a matter of fact, supermarket standard data stayed around way too long as state of the art in the field of marketing. Basically, between 1980 and about 1995, there was really no good research that didn't involve supermarket scanner data. And as mentioned, whether it was the, the burgeoning growth of the internet, there were a lot of other opportunities, but people were like, yeah, but we know what people buy. Yeah, but that's not enough. Then, of course, in the 1990s and 2000s came the internet. Of course, it seemed pretty good. You could track page browsing. That's pretty exciting. Now you could track what people are looking at. You could track products considered. So I would know if you went to a product page and didn't actually buy it. Matter of fact, I know how much time you spent on that product page. Again, think about that in contrast to the supermarket. All I know is what you bought. I don't, maybe you stood in front of spaghetti sauce for 30 seconds, but I'd never know it. Unless, I mean, matter of fact, even if you put it in the cart, I wouldn't know how much time you spent there. Well, now you could, on I mean, the internet, you could know this. You could know targeted ads. You could target people's ads based on purchase history. You could link it to past experience. It, it was just wonderful. You could link it to offline behavior. And a matter of fact, a very, the first paper ever written in academia, a model of website browsing behavior estimated on clickstream data. What do you think that paper's about? It's what websites do people go to based on their clickstream data? So again, very simple title recommending. So again, academics always come after the people in practice. Technology invented the internet and the ability to track people and academics are like, hey, that's pretty interesting data. We should probably do something about it, okay? Now, internet data revolutionized marketing, but you could only see the pages sewn, but actually what you couldn't see is what things they looked at on the page. You could just see that they went to website A, but you didn't know what they looked at on the page. You could see, you could see website traffic on your, day, on your website, but not necessarily on other websites. Um, matter of fact, it was during that time, for those of you that know, Comscore and Nielsen have massive panels where they put devices on your hard drive with your permission, and now they can track your behavior on every website, but that didn't used to be there. And Cust what, how about customers are thinking? Like, why are customers doing what they're doing? So all of this seemed wonderful. It seemed like the golden age. And, and you didn't have its link to television. Again, it seemed like the golden age, but it wasn't. Now, in the next half, the last half of my talk, I'm going to stop reviewing history, and I'm going to tell you state-of-the-art marketing science come 2012 because that's what you're here for. You're not here to hear a history lesson, but I wanted to motivate it. You're here to hear about my vision of the future. Or another way to think about this slide is it's slide 14, and now I'm going to tell you about my research. I've been very patient to tell you about these other people's work. Now I've got to tell you about my own. Okay. So this is a study we did with a company called Sorensen Associates about five years ago, where he had a, this is a, this Herb Sorensen is an entrepreneur, and he had a brilliant idea. What if instead of just measuring what people do at the checkout counter, which again has been around since the 80s, what if we actually measure where people are in the store? Sounds great. And how long they spend there, but how do you do that? You're not going to attach like a little chip to somebody when they walk in the store. So he actually came up with an idea of putting little devices on the bottom of supermarket carts. And so he actually got about 10 major retailers around the United States to insert little RFID chips on the bottom of supermarket carts that would emit a ping, not a sound, but a radio frequency ping every five seconds. And you could then not only know what someone did at the checkout counter, which has been around since the 80s, but everything they did in the store. So as an example of that, take a look at this picture. This black line here represents someone's path throughout a supermarket. It's just one person's path. Each of these little black dots represents that five-second ping. These red squares represent the products that the person put in the cart. And so now, let's go back. If I went back four slides, the golden age seemed like supermarket scanner data. Imagine you could append supermarket scanner data with where somebody went in the store, 
and what they put in the cart and when and which product categories they stood in front of but possibly didn't buy. All of a sudden, the insights you can get about consumer behavior are very, very different. And what we did, just as an example, we actually built a real-time system that you could now attach to a supermarket cart. So, for example, um, Liz Ann's walking along through the supermarket. I know how long you've been at every point in the store. I know what you've put in your shopping cart. I can now make you real-time recommendations. Like, for example, you've just put pasta in your bag, in your cart. Maybe she's going to go to sauce, so maybe I should give her a discount for sauce. As a matter of fact, the way our system works is areas of the store get hot and cold as you're moving along through the store. Think of there being, I'll show you a heat map in just a second, but literally in real time you can predict where people are going to go in stores and what they're going to buy, which means you can monetize it. So that's one example. And by the way, this is an example of what one of the pictures in our paper where this is a heat map of a standard grocery store where the aisles, these, you know, these here represent the aisles where the products sit. Um, notice the red areas, which are the hot areas of the store, are always on the outside of the store. That's called the racetrack or the ring of the store. It turns out that the really cold areas of the store are in the blue, which means if any of you are in the retailing business and somebody wants to sell you shelf space in the middle of an aisle, don't do it. It's absolutely horrible real estate in a store. And as a matter of fact, the thing that mathematics can do is, you know, because then when I presented this to Walmart, they asked a very good question. They said, Professor Bradlow, how about an alternative opinion? Maybe it's that the products stink in the middle of the store, and that's why nobody goes there. And I said, well, you've got to give me a little bit of credit. I thought of that, and I'm a mathematician, and what I do for a living is I can understand which reason is it. Is it because the product sucks that's in the middle of the aisle, or is it because people just don't like going to the middle of the aisles? My favorite uh, factoid about going through supermarkets is that, uh, I'll ask everyone to guess here, you can raise your hand, how many times do you think the average person traverses an aisle, which means go, starts on one end and goes all the way through and comes out the other? So on an average supermarket trip, how many traverses does the average person take? I heard three, two, one, two, Point 0.2. That's actually the closest guess so far. It's less than one. It's about point 0.6. And the reason that always bothered me is I remember watching TV shows, of course, reruns as I was a kid of, you know, like Leave it to Beaver from the 50s where you see the woman walking up and down the aisles. People just don't move that way in stores. As a matter of fact, this isn't just true for supermarkets. It's true for most retail stores. People do what's called excursions. They go in one side of an aisle and come back out the same side. They actually don't go all the way through the store, which, all the way through an aisle, which makes the middle of the aisle even worse. But this is an example of something, unless you had data and technology, you could never have known this fact. You could never have developed a real-time system for making product recommendations for people inside of a store. Because the, the output, again, remember, Scanner data doesn't give you this. It doesn't give you this bit of insight. And so, of course, this is me. This is my colleague, Pete Fader. This is one of our former doctoral students, Sam Wee, testing behavioral hypotheses using an integrated model of grocery store shopping path and purchase behavior. So we were the first academics to get data, not just on what people bought, but where they were in the store. And so the insight here is what could you learn from technology? Technology allows you to measure the path, not just the purchases. What better predictions can you make by knowing it? So for example, if you're a store, should you invest in technology to measure people's paths? That's what we can answer with this type of paper, okay? Um, but imagine one limitation of this work was we knew where you were in the store, but we didn't know where you looked, what you looked at. So actually, I started a whole bunch of new research on eye tracking. So imagine people walking around the store with, I mean, they don't literally have, say the word police on it, but imagine people walking around the store with little uh, cam eye cameras on. Like, just like people walk around with things to talk on their cell phone, it's the same device, it just happens to have a camera on it. And by the way, no matter how hard you try, when you move your head, your eyes go with it. So when your head moves, you can triangulate on what the person's looking at. Okay? So imagine having this data. So now not only do I know where you are in the store, but I know what you're looking at. We actually, took, we actually collected this data for about 10,000 people, and we found the following, which is um, if you look at a standard planogram of a store, so imagine this is a shelf, let's say it's of orange juice, um, eye level is, is the best, and not only that, 
but left is better than right. Now, it'll be very interesting to see if in Great Britain, I don't know if this is true, if right would be better than left. See, it's because of the way you drive. No, no, no. Let, let me go back for a second. Actually, I forgot to tell this interesting factoid. There's a lot of paths that depend on what your culture is, and so there's a lot known about that. The reason I was bringing this up was, um, turns out the left side of a planogram, we scan from left to right. So people in cultures that read the other direction, it might be the opposite result, is what I was saying. But either way, again, this is not, again, this isn't fictitious behavior. This isn't my hypothesis, sitting in my office thinking deep ivory tower thoughts. I wonder which part of the shelf is worth more. This is based on data in marketing that was enabled by technology. And again, if you had told me 10 years ago that I would have had the ability to collect path data and eye tracking data, I would have said you're crazy. You can never see the future of technology. I can't, maybe you can, maybe that's why you guys are all in the business world and I'm in academia. I wait till the data happens and then I grab it. Maybe you guys have that vision. I didn't have that vision that I'd be able to do this. Um, academics were there to work with practice. Um, so imagine, a, and also imagine a world where customer's behavior could be integrated with traditional marketing research. So I actually had lots of discussion. By the way, it's nice to see so many familiar faces and former students. Um, for those people that don't know, so I was at Facebook this afternoon with uh, Sam and Greg, and I, what I was talking to them about is, what, what problem do you think Facebook is interested in answering? What problem, what's Facebook's number one issue that they want to answer? How can I raise my share price? Yes, they're interested in that too. And I really do wish I had sold them short at $38 a share, but unfortunately, I don't do that. But yes, that's not the answer. What do you think? What is it? Privacy concerns? That was brought up, oh, sorry, privacy. Um, that was brought up, but that's, I don't think that's their number one concern. Monetizing the data, but specifically, what do they need to prove to be able to make money on their data asset? Linking Facebook activity to purchasing. That's almost right. That's an A minus answer. That's not the real answer. The real, let me just say why. The real answer is, is well, let me ask you a question. How many people here believe that Facebook, if someone, you know, people on Facebook talk about a product or service a lot, it's more likely to be bought? How many people believe that? Okay, it's only a small number. Let me just say, by the way, that is true. But that's not Facebook's question. Facebook needs to answer a much harder question. Conditional on the amount of TV you viewed, conditional on the amount of digital media you've already received, does Facebook advertising add anything above and beyond that? That's the business question they have to answer because they want people to shift dollars from different forms of advertising over to Facebook. The only way to answer that question, the only way to answer that question is you need a sample of people where you know their TV viewing, where you know their internet behavior, and you know what's being said on Facebook. It's very hard data to get. Matter of fact, it does not exist yet, but Nielsen, that's why I have this slide up here, they're trying to build what's called a cross-platform measurement panel, where literally you can measure set-top box data, internet data, Facebook data, digital, digital media data, all these ones so you can do what's called the ad attribution problem. Everybody wants to know the ROI of advertising, but unless you have the data, you really can't answer that question, okay? Um, let me just say, by the way, I wanted to bring this slide up, and this is actually a paper I just recently wrote with a computer science colleague of mine. Um, I worked, I don't think Sam mentioned this, prior to being in academia, I worked at DuPont for five years in their corporate marketing division. And the way DuPont wanted, if DuPont wanted to know something, here's what they did. They would pay a bunch of money to a third party vendor to run a marketing research study, typically a survey, and they would ask a bunch of questions and three to four months later, they would find out what was important to their customers. And that was state of the art in 1991 when I was working there. Well, let me tell you what Tom Lee and I did in this paper. Tom Lee's a computer scientist. It took him half a day to write a web scraping program that would scrape all the text that people would type in on user-generated content sites. So think of online ratings and reviews. So we did this for toasters, we did it for refrigerators, we did it for cameras. Think of doing this for all kinds of different product categories. It took Tom one half of one day to write this program. It updates itself in real time. It's, matter of fact, as I'm speaking right now, it's running. 
Okay? And let me show you as an example of something we found from this. So this 45 degree line represents, imagine, instead, imagine Tom Lee and Eric Bradlow's paper never existed, but you had to do traditional methods, like using a survey, or you had to do like, you know, let's go to consumer reports and see what they, people said they care about. This 45 degree line represents our automated method finds everything that's in those studies. And a matter of fact, there are a lot of them. If you look at VOC, that stands for voice of the customer only, there are a bunch of X's up here in the upper right hand quadrant that are really important to people that these traditional methods don't even find. So the way I describe it when I talk to my students is you, for two six packs of beer, and two undergraduate engineering majors, you can write a web scraping program to replace what the traditional marketing research industry has built for the last 30 years. Now, if that doesn't scare you as to how the face of marketing is changing, it really should. Literally, within real time, in half a day, we could understand which attributes of digital cameras people cared about. How important were they? How likely were they to drive purchase intention? Literally, automated, real time, with no cost. Pretty impressive, pretty amazing. So marketing research is alive and well, but it's changed. And what I mean by that is all the stuff on the left, I hope for you Wharton graduates, those things look familiar to you. These were all the kinds of stuff that were in our marketing research and core marketing class, no matter whether you were there in 1960, 1970, 1980, 1990, 2000, et cetera. All this stuff on the right is now what I teach in my marketing research class. I have to tell people about user-generated content, about web scraping, about ad attribution models. You have to tell people that, because that's what people in the field are doing today in terms of marketing science. Now, you might ask yourself, well, what is Wharton going to do about this? Because all of you, I know, want Wharton to be the thought leader in this topic area. Well, the good news is that we are. And that again, you know, is this the golden age of marketing research? And I say, no, it's not. Let me tell you what I'm dreaming for the future. This is my dream for the next five years. I hope I'm back here in London. Maybe Sam and others will invite me back here. Lizanne will invite me back here in five years. Here's what I hope I'm talking to you about in five years. Remember that data that I told you, like set-top box data and internet data and all that stuff? I hope I have that data in the next five years. Here's the one that I'm, I'm going to spend all of my time on between now and then. All of the mathematical routines I take, I do for a living, unfortunately can't be done in real time. What I mean by real time is like a billionth of a second when that computer has to decide what, it, what ad to show you. Unfortunately, it takes longer than that. Well, that makes it nice to know, but not very practical. So we have to develop faster methods to do these algorithms and stuff. Say it again. Yeah, so Google does have algorithms for that, but let me just say, they take a ton of shortcuts, and I'm not saying they're bad shortcuts. I know a lot of the people at Google well. So the answer is they do some of that, but also let me just say, what Google can't do because of privacy concerns is they actually don't, they're by law, they're not allowed to use most of their data to make advertising recommendations. So like for example, don't you think your search behavior is probably very predictive of what you're likely to buy? They're actually not allowed to use search data. In, they, they can't, they literally have to keep those two data silos separate from each other. But Google, that's what I was saying earlier, better research right now is coming out of non-academic universities like a Google, like a Facebook, but you know why? Because they're trying to solve these multi-billion dollar problems in real time, and we as academics, at least up until a, a minute ago, and up until four years ago, we didn't have access to the same data that they did. Okay, um, more automation, and what are the key variables to track? Actually, this one, this is also something I'm spending a lot of time on is data compression, which is, you know, let's imagine the US government said tomorrow, you can't track all this stuff at the individual level. Well, there are ways that you can still figure stuff out, even if you don't have the best data possible, and we call that data compression. So I want to spend the last just five minutes or so, and then I really, I'm happy to stand up here until tomorrow morning at noon when my flight is and answer questions. Because this is, I'm, I'm, I'm selfish. I'm here to talk to you, but I'm here to motivate you to tell me what you know. So Wharton, this, everyone in this room should be happy. Wharton is the only school in the world that has taken a thought leadership position in what I'll call quantitative and analytic marketing. 
My colleague Pete Fader and I four years ago started a center called the Wharton Customer Analytics Initiative. And what we do at our center is we want to be the leading research center focusing on data-driven customer level analysis. Now, what do I mean by customer level? Let me be clear. I use this example all the time. Let's say Sony Pictures called me up today and said, Professor Bradlow, we have a new movie coming out. We'd like you to help us forecast demand for that movie. I'd say, that's great. Go to somebody else. If Sony Pictures instead came to me and said, Professor Bradlow, we have a panel of 100,000 customers, and we want to forecast what each of those individuals is going to do over the next 12 months in terms of their movies, and how much popcorn they're going to buy, and how much soda they're going to buy, and the effectiveness of marketing towards those people. Then I'd raise my hand and say, that's us. Customer analytics. We don't do aggregate level analyses. And I don't do aggregate level analyses because I fundamentally believe they're wrong. You lose insight. The minute you're not predicting what a customer is going to do, what a customer is going to react to, you've aggregated it up to a level that really isn't the unit of decision making. And let me just say, technology is going to make it, whether it's today, a year from today, or five years from today, everything's going to be trackable at the level of the individual customer. How does the American Red Cross get money? Wills, legacies, but at the micro level, donations. So they want to know how to turn disaster donors into regular donors. So they have history on every individual and how much they've donated and why they donated the first time, and they want to optimize their email campaigns to get people to turn from one-time donors into persistent donors. It's actually the very same business problem as StubHub. StubHub wants to turn one-time ticket buyers into persistent ticket buyers using individual level data and email marketing. So I, you probably never would have guessed in your lifetime that these companies would all appear on the same slide. Now, they don't all have exactly the same business problem, but every single one of them knows that they will make more money if they can monetize their individual level data. And that's what we do as a center. And so um, that's me, Eric Bradlow. You can see my email address. Um, just as a major takeaway, as long as technology keeps advancing, the golden age is never today.